So I'm just going to start with a little bit of webinar housekeeping. So the session is recorded. The recording is just done to be put on our Tavi Camry website on the Knowledge Hub. Um, feel free to keep your camera off if you don't want to be included. If you don't want to speak, just pop your questions in the chat and then I'll read them out as well. Um, if you don't want to be included in the recording, please let one of the Tavi Camry members of staff know and then we can remove you from the video. Um, we'd like the session to be interactive, so feel free to ask questions. It's nothing too formal. And if you don't mind keeping yourself on mute while the others are speaking, just to minimise interference. So we're joined here by Lizzie and Chris from ADAS, and I'll hand over to them just for an introduction. And then we'll go around and if each of you would like to introduce yourselves as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'll start. So, um, yeah, it's good to see everyone. My name is Lizzie Sagu. I'm a soil scientist at ADAS. I'm actually based over our centre, Rachel, in the, the flat of the Fens near Cambridge. Um, I work on sort of anything soil management, nutrient management related, um, including quite a bit of work on organic materials and more recently a bit more work on vegetable nutrition as well. So and it, yeah, it's good to, good to be here today. Chris? Right, Chris Creed, um, ADAS advisor working in Wales on the Tully Cymru scheme. I've been to see most of the farms here, I think. Um, it's a good opportunity having Lizzie on the end of this um, Zoom because uh, she's um, a bit more uh, a bit more au fait with soil science matters than I am. So she gives um, not only a sort of um, rustic approach, but a bit of science back to back it up. So if you've got any real problems with the soil, you know, don't just skip over it. Then we might as well get them out in the open and discuss it because if you've got things, I'm sure everybody else will. But um, yeah, that's me really. Lovely. Ali, do you want to go next? Just on mute. I'm Ali from Ali's Edibles in the Vale of Glamorgan, and uh, we run a small market garden here providing uh, salads and veg to the locals. So you're on some pretty high pH there, aren't you, Ali? We are. Very high. Calcius, we're on the top of limestone cliffs. And when I did, when I first came here 10 years ago, I did a soil sample and it was nine. Nine, wow. It's not now, but it was then. <laughs> Lovely. That That's great. Yeah. Simon, do you want to go next? Okay, hi everyone. Um, uh, at the moment, I'm just uh, running my own garden. I've been doing that for the last 12 years. I'm interested in permaculture. Uh, I'm four miles north of Brecon, quite acidic soil. Um, so you get great blueberries. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd be interested to learn more about how to get more out of uh, growing things, get things to grow better. Lovely, that's great. <laughs> okay. Lara, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, yeah, I'm Lara Bean from Angle Wall Garden. And my husband and I and my children have got a walled garden here, six acre wall garden. We grow asparagus, we've got a very established asparagus patch, cherries along the middle wall of the garden. And I do veg boxes and I do flowers, um, uh, predominantly dried flowers. <laughs> and I'm particularly interested in regenerative and organic methods. Are you planting some asparagus this year then, uh, Lara? We are. We are. The exciting the exciting project of the year is we're expanding our, our asparagus because our asparagus is 20 years old, so it's about time to replant. So Chris is helping us, advising us on that. So we're about to launch into that big project. So That's we've right. got soil samples. We're waiting for the results. <laughs> don't have the results yet, but... Right, so they're often in the lab now, are they? They are. They've been there about well, a good week now, so I'm expecting any day. Any day, yeah. They usually turn around in 24 hours. Yeah, so yeah, one, yeah. That's one thing while we're on, it pays you to get a soil analysis. Um, Toby Cymru don't cover it because it's sort of part of training, but uh, they're only about, if you have the basic um, PK, magnesium and pH, it's only about, I think it's a tenner a sample, isn't it? Does it home to grow? Yeah, something like that. It's not, well, it's definitely worthwhile doing. It's a bit daft not to um, understand your soil, and um, if you if you've got a 
a basic idea of the, the nutrition that's already there, then it gives you a chance to um, add to it. And I think Farming Connect, uh, we're in sort of a bit disarray at the moment because we're changing from one Farming Connect to another. But uh, there were schemes in Farming Connect where you could get soil analysis done and then um, it was all explained. So um, hopefully that will come back soon. Great. And then we've also got Chloe, is it? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, she's from the Perennial Green Manures Project based in the Tubby Valley. So uh, there's a little bit of information about it in the chat as well if anyone's interested. And uh, lovely. Do you want to start on? Yeah, will do. So I will just share my screen. Right. Can you see that all right? Yep. Yeah, fine here. Perfect. So um, I can't now see the chat. I can't seem to, I've never seemed to manage to get all the screens up at once. But if someone puts something in the chat, um, Rachel, Chris, if you could monitor that, that'd be great. Yeah, and um, as Rachel said, it's really informal. So please feel free to chip in with questions, you know, just unmute yourself and ask or put stuff in the chat. Um, so yeah, it'll be a bit of a double act with me and Chris. Um, Chris has said to me earlier, if I just talk, he'll chip in as and when. So that seems like a good plan. Um, we've got an hour today. So this was sort of broadly the topics I thought we'd, um, we'd touch on. Um, sort of a mix of basic nutrient management sort of presentation with a few other bits and pieces in that are possibly a bit more topical. Um, I'm quite conscious that a lot of these slides are ones that I've delivered recently probably to sort of bigger conventional growers so I'm not sure um, um, sort of how relevant or some of the information will be but please feel free to yeah go and ask questions if you, you want to understand more about you know about some of the some of the things in context of your own businesses so I'm going to touch on fertilizer recommendation systems and then really go through the main nutrients that we should be thinking about in terms of crop nutrition so that's your um, standard nitrogen, phosphate, potash, not forgetting sulfur, and also micronutrients. And I think it was Ali who said high pH. So obviously, that, that then potentially presents issues for my, micronutrients. Um, we'll spend a bit of time talking about nitrogen um, challenges with nitrogen. It's, it's the nutrient that tends to give us the biggest yield response um, out of all the nutrients. It, it's also it's a challenge. Um, one price of nitrogen has shot up so massively, which has kind of put it into focus. But also um, the challenge of nitrogen is the fact that it doesn't stay where you put it and that um, it can cause environmental problems if we lose it from the system. You know, if we put nitrogen on, we want to get it in our crop. But um, it, it, it is at risk of loss via leaching if we get drainage or to the atmosphere um, as ammonia or nitrous oxide. So that's why we tend to quite often spend quite a bit of time talking about nitrogen and making sure we get our nitrogen management right. So firstly, I mean, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but in terms of fertilizer recommendations, we've got the Nutrient Management Guide or RB29, I think as it will forever be called, um, that's published by AHDB as a series of seven guides. Um, they're available free to download from the website. Um, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of really good information in there. That's where we have effectively collated together um, all of our knowledge, um, the results of research done to date to give what I would consider to be our you know our, our best available advice to growers. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's kind of the best the best that we've got on the knowledge we've got. So the sections that I wanted to highlight, um, section one, principles of nutrient management. This does have some really good background information on. Um, soil indices, just general principles of managing fertilizers and manures, um, and is a good reference document. Um, and then the two others um, are flagged there. So the section six is the section on vegetable and bulbs. I'm not sure whether some of you mentioned fruit or not, but there's also then section seven, which is fruit, vine, and hops. Those guides have recommendations for all the key um, crop groups there. What about um, section two then? The one about organic materials and how does that? Um, oh, yeah, that was how... that's a that's an omission on my part. Yeah, you're right. So if you're using organic materials, section two is a good one to refer to as well. Um, thanks, Chris. So it's, yeah, section one is principles. Two is organic materials. Three is grassland. 
four is so combinable crops, arable crops, and five is potatoes. Um, so they publish them in sections, which doesn't it makes it slightly easier because not most people don't need all of them. So you can download the various um, the relevant ones. I think the thing to bear in mind is that if you're an organic grower, you're still putting nutrients on in the form of various um, organic matters, and you still need to know what sort of levels that you put in on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yes, yeah, so if you're using organic materials, that's good advice in section two, and also the principles of nutrient use. I mean, as, as organic growers, Chris, I'm right in thinking that there are still forms of those nutrients that you can apply. It's not necessarily as straightforward as conventional production, but you can still, there's still liming products that you can apply and still so, other sources of those nutrients you can use, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, a bit of background in, in terms of those, the fertilizer recommendations we give, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but um, nitrogen, phosphate and potash recommendations are all based on an index system, um, which is uh, effectively, it's a, it's a way of measuring what's in our soil um, in order to give recommendations for what we should add. So um, for nitrogen, we've got the soil nitrogen supply index, um, and I've got a couple of slides on that. For phosphorus, um, we use a soil index based on an Olsen's phosphorus sodium bicarbonate extraction. And for um, potassium and magnesium, it's an ammonium nitrate extract. So that's just the method the lab use um, to look at how much phosphate and potash magnesium um, is available in the soil. So um, I think that fertilizer use and crop nutrition seem to have become very topical at the moment, um, um, particularly over the last year or so maybe a bit more than in in the in the past because of the hike in energy prices which has had major knock-on effects for fertilizer process for fertilizer prices and that's really focused attention on our nutrient inputs um, this graph let me just get my laser pointer up this graph here is a graph showing fertilizer prices so we've got price um, as a pence per kilogram of the nutrients the nitrogen is the blue line Phosphate is the orange line and potash is the sort of greeny line. And we've got sort of a timeline from 2007 through to present there. And you can see this massive increase in fertilizer prices. Um, and that, um, and we're now sort of significantly above the previous 2008 price as well. Um, and so that, that for some growers has changed the economics of nutrient use, meaning that for some crops, I, I wouldn't say for vegetable crops, but definitely for combinable crops, um, that, that means that the economic optimism is a little bit less than it was previously. Um, in terms of vegetable crops, when we've been asked about the impact of rising fertilizer prices on, on vegetable crops, my guidance has been that you shouldn't be reducing your fertilizer rates as a result of the increase in fertilizer prices because because you've got such high value high value crops but what i would say is that um it it's all the more more important now more than ever to to focus on um good management of these nutrients and steps to maximize the efficiency of our nutrient use so we've had sort of the fertilizer increase in fertilizer prices and and also an availability issue that's had sort of focused our attention on crop nutrition but i mean there's there's other issues as well you know particularly environmentally um you know more and more growers i think are interested in the carbon footprint of their crop and actually if you use fertilizer nitrogen that is a quite a key component of your crop carbon footprint so anything that you can do to reduce that will reduce your crop carbon footprint. So I mean, that's focusing attention as well. Um, it's also remembering that um, when we put nutrients on the soil, mainly nitrogen, but also phosphate as well, um, if we lose them from that soil system, they're potentially environmentally environmental threats as well. So with nitrogen, you can lose it by nitrate leaching, ammonia emissions or nitrous oxide. And also with phosphate um, overland, flow wash off from the soil can lead to phosphorus loss of water phosphorus loss into water which are all environmental threats and really what we need to focus on is we need to focus on accurate crop nutrition getting as much of what we put on in the crop and minimizing any losses to the environment so in terms of you know what 
what steps can we take um, to try and make sure we're getting our crop nutrition as accurate as possible. This is the sort of slide I've been presenting to farm groups recently in terms of what I think of the list of things um, to focus on. And I've kind of put this impact arrow there. So start at the top. These are the things that are going to have the biggest impact. Um, and I think the thing to start off with is say, you know, we need to start by getting the basics right. So this is this slide's very much focused on nitrogen use efficiency, although it, it is applicable also to some of the other nutrients. Um, so first of all, top of the list, um, maintain your soil at target pH. Um, I appreciate that that's that's harder to reduce your soil pH. But if you're if you're below the target pH of about six and a half, um, that will affect your nutrient use efficiency for other nutrients. Um, some of you may have seen this um, this image that we've got here. What what this tries to sort of graphically it's a bit um, smaller screen, but what what it kind of shows is um, the availability of those different nutrient elements at different pHs, and the reason why our target pH. Is 6.5 is because at that pH we've got good availability for most of those nutrients so if your pH is significantly below or above that um, it will compromise the availability of some of those nutrients so that, I think the key thing is if you're if you're so if you are below target pH um, liming will help you increase your nutrient use efficiency obviously if you're on soils that are naturally high pH you can't necessarily reduce you know you can't reduce your ph but it's um, and i'm sure you will be if that if that's your circumstances aware that um that high ph can lead in particular to micronutrient deficiencies and it's just being aware of the um what your land is like and those deficiencies that you might see so you're aware of them and that you can treat for them if you, if you do so, um, if you get a soil analysis um, Lizzie, it will give you a, a pH figure and on the bottom bit it gives you um, a lime requirement. If you put that lime on, say, at a pH of 5.8 and that lime requirement you put on relative to that pH, what, what effect does that have on the pH and how long does it take to work? Um, the lime, if it's a lime requirement that's come from um, like a lab report, that should have, that should have come from RB209. So that should be targeted to try and get you up to the target pH. Right. If you're significantly below the target pH, there is guidance in RB209 about splitting that line application and potentially plowing half down and then, um, you know, sp um, putting the top dress in the other half. So if you, if you are quite a bit below the target pH, I would recommend going and looking at the guidance in section one of RB209. Right. So the line sort of brings it up to... Uh the target is 6.5 it's that that's the amount i'm pretty sure that the amount of lime at dif the different ph's is aiming to bring your soil up to that target ph mm. right okay that's good yeah. um okay so yeah ph is a ph is uh, start with that one you know that's the one to get right first that will have the biggest impact but then, I mean, and this applies for all the nutrients, you know, ensure you've, I've got here, ensure you've got a sufficient supply of phosphate, potash, magnesium, and sulfur. That's thinking of a point of view of nitrogen use efficiency. But, but if you, you know, this is why we refer back to this sort of Liebig's barrel principle. It's the idea that um, your yield will be det determined or limited by your, your, your limiting factor. So if one of those nutrients is limiting crop growth, um, the nutrient use efficiency of the others um, will be limited. So particularly in terms of nitrogen, we do know that nitrogen use efficiency will be reduced if you, you are below um, target for any of these other nutrients. And, and a lot of the, these top ones, um, you can check with your soil analysis. So standard soil analysis, um, which you should do every three to five years, get it analyzed for pH, pK and magnesium. Um, and then you can use those results um, to get your fertilizer recommendations. I would say I don't think soil analysis is useful for sulfur. We've got a couple of slides um, later on on sulfur, and it isn't it isn't one of the standard soil analysis suites. Um, then the next one I've got is good soil structure. Um, I, th I think I did a webinar for you last year on um, managing soils. Um, and actually, the next I won't spend too much of time on this now because the next slide is on soils. Um, then next, allowing for nutrients from organic materials. And um, we've got a few slides on that as well and assessing your soil nitrogen supply. So those, I'd kind of say, are our basics, basic good nutrient management planning. 
Um, we are now getting some growers that are asking what else they can do to try and further improve their nutrient, in particular their nitrogen use efficiency. So, so the next ones I've got on the list are kind of almost the, the added bonus. What else can you do to go a bit further than your, 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 your basic good nutrient management planning? So the first one on the list I've got there is actually measuring soil mineral nitrogen. So a lot of us um, assess our soil nitrogen supply based on the field assessment method. So looking at soil type, rainfall and previous cropping, um, there is potential to improve the accuracy of our nitrogen applications by actually measuring soil mineral nitrogen. So that might be something worth considering. And other ones I've got, and we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail on some of these, placement of phosphorus fertilizer. Um, so a lot of vegetable crops are quite responsive to phosphorus. And we know that actually placing the fertilizer, um, particularly for um, crops that aren't particularly well rooted, that can be quite efficient um, way of getting phosphorus into the plant. And then we've got these slightly more kind of precision <laughs> approaches to crop nutrition. Um, which some growers are interested in. So things like, when I say fertilizer, nitrogen efficiency products, it's things like use of ureas or nitrification inhibited or coated products. I think you've seen quite a, quite a, um, a range of products being put on the market now that um, are, are, are advertising themselves with claims that you know, they can improve the nutrient use efficiency. Some growers are interested in variable rate application um, and also trying to match application timing better to crop growth so that's kind of a suite of techniques that we've got to try and improve our nutrient use efficiency what about um linking um the, the fertilizer or the, the nutrients you apply to the farm rotation so you sort of go after a big feeding crop you you know you you sort of work it out like that i'm not quite sure quite how you allow for that and you know i, I cover yeah. How cover crops come into that and you know avoiding bare ground that sort of thing yeah so if um if thinking are you thinking say for example like a high nitrogen residue brassica crop that would leave that you'd you'd expect to have a high nitrogen supply after it yeah i think in, in rotation do you really want to um put the the nitrogen onto the sort of brassica type crops or the high in nitrogen users and then the, the following year you have something that's um you know that's um, less um affected by nitrogen i mean i, I always imagine the brassica family have a huge response but something like maybe beet much less so yeah and that i don't know to what extent you you manipulate your rotation to fit that but you should definitely be manipulating your fertilizer use to account for that Mm. Um, and some of that's built into our soil nitrogen supply tables that we've got in RB29 that accounts for the fact that some crops leave high nitrogen residues. And we would also, I mean, where we advise soil mineral nitrogen testing um, is in situations, which we say it's, it's most beneficial in situations where your soil nitrogen supply is likely to be high or uncertain. And one of the examples we give would be following um, you know, a, 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 a crop that leaves a, leaves a lot of leafy green residue in the field where we might expect there to be sort of greater level of nitrogen mineralization from that material. So, so there's definitely the, the crops that you grow definitely leave a legacy effect in the field that we need to take account of for the following crops. Yeah, I mean, one crop we grow in Wales that um, I think doesn't like a lot of nitrogen is the sort of pumpkin tribe, which is. Um, okay courgettes and i think rb209 can be a bit confusing there because the pumpkin and squash recommendations are also for courgettes and courgettes are a lot more vegetative so i'm not keen on putting a lot of nitrogen on pumpkins i'd rather just put it on as you see the crop developing yeah and i, I think it's worth pointing out that for some of these minority crops so you're right in terms of rb209 um we've got the recommendations for courgettes and you're right as well we've because we've done some nitrogen response work on courgettes and seen reasonable nitrogen response i would say are you because you're saying that i can't think now but are pumpkins and squat um are they in with the same are they the same recommendations as for yeah I think they're the same as cause yet so they're not separated okay. so, um, so, so i mean that, a bit confusing. that would be because there hasn't been additional work on pumpkins and so there's made, made an assumption that it's it, it's closest to courgettes and that's actually where um having your own specialist knowledge on some of these more minority crops is really useful because um, RB209 is based on experimental work and if we haven't done the experimental work on that crop that information could be lacking so that's where experience is really valuable. 
and Chris, like you said, it's your if it's your experience that the pumpkins don't quite like as much. Um, you know, it's quite it's useful to know that. Yeah, I have difficulty with some vegetable growers that they um, they equate water and nitrogen with um, crops needing cheering up, as they put it, and then they put way too much on, and you end up with a crop that's sort of completely rank and tends to bolt through the first set of flowers. Um, yeah, I've just put one slide in on soil. Um, my background is soil science, so I need to put at least one slide in. Um, it's to make the point that um, you know good soil structure is important in terms of crop nutrition. If 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 you if you have compact soils, and that compaction restricts rooting, you've restricted the volume of soil that your crop can access um, nutrients from. I mean, this photo here is a compacted soil in an unnewed crop. Um, photo that Andy Richardson had provided us and that crop is yield limited because of that compaction and it's it's just particularly to note for a lot of these vegetable crops um, that they are because of the rotations and the operations that we have um, to establish and to harvest them they're kind of harder on the soil so we there are more at risk of soil structural damage so we've got a greater risk of putting compaction in and then you're also growing crops that tend to be more susceptible to compaction so you've got kind of got those two things together so um it was i would know it, it's it's worth being aware of um the advice which is maybe easier said than done is to try and avoid putting compaction into your soil ideally in the first place but but if you do have compaction digging a hole to assess your soil structure and identify if you do have compaction then if you have got it then you can take steps to try and remove it What's your approach then with minimum cultivation, like min till, and the, the effect that has on soil structure? Um, any reductions in cultivation, the, the, the less you can move your soil, the better in terms of soil structure and soil health. So I think from a soil, overall soil quality point of view, moving to minimum tillage is beneficial, but there's a reason we till soils and different crops have different requirements. And, you know, if, it, if it's necessary in order to create a seed bed, or if it's necessary to till because you put compaction in and you need to remove it, then, you know, then you need to do it. So I, I think my opinion would be to only cultivate and till if you have to. And I, I would advise, um, a set, you know, visual assessment of soils, digging um, digging out a split of soil and looking at it and always kind of challenging yourself to, do I need to do this level of cultivation and can I step back a little bit? Yeah, Does that good. sound reasonable to you? Yeah, that's, that's my own yeah. thoughts. Exactly. I don't know if anybody else wants to chip in, but that picture that Andy's provided with there is from the Brassica and Allium Centre. That is horrendous soil compaction, but you can see there that there's no soil for those roots to exploit so it doesn't matter what the nutrition's like because the roots won't be able to find it that's the yeah you know, the, that's the point of that slide so if your structure's not good there's no good throwing extra fertilizer on because it won't be used and then it's costing you more money so what you've got to do then is employ improve your structure first yeah and sometimes another example that andy had given us um actually for that for the project that he shared that picture was um it was a vegetable crop. I can't remember what it was, but it was following sugar beet where there'd been horrendous compaction with the sugar beet. And so sometimes, I mean, we, sometimes you can look at the rotation and you can see a crop where, you know, there's potential for compaction coming after that crop. And then it's maybe considering whether what crop you want to follow that with, because if you go in with a crop that's susceptible to compaction and a high value crop, you know, they hadn't, the, the example that he shared with us, they hadn't, they hadn't allowed themselves enough time to address that compaction issue. Yeah. Well, I think if you take home that slide from this talk, I think that's um, you know a long way towards improving your, your basic nutrition as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next couple of slides um, I've got are on sort of organic materials. This is sort of one of my favorite areas to work on. It's when I started working at ADAS, I was working on lots of projects on making the most of manures. Um, so this first slide is really um, kind of to highlight the value of all these organic materials. You know, for years, we um, all the work that we were doing, we were trying to get home this message of um, 
these are these are these materials are a resource they're not a waste product you know because i think some growers were some farmers were still treating these materials as a waste product and actually one thing that the increase in fertilizer prices has done very nicely is it's highlighted the nutrient value of these materials and so it's always quite effective to start off by saying well what's it worth what's your what's your manure worth this table here um it's sort of um working out the nutrient value of a typical 40 ton per hectare application of cattle manure so if you apply it 40 tons per hectare based on a sort of a standard analysis of cattle manure you would apply your crop would get about 24 kilograms per hectare of crop available nitrogen so you'd, you'd apply, be applying quite a bit more total nitrogen but your crop would see about 24 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen you're applying 128 of phosphate and 300 and 76 of potash. Now we can work out the value of those nutrients by looking at the, um, the cost of fertilizer. So how much would it have cost you to have bought that, those nutrients um, in fertilizer? And the comparison I've got here is just to highlight the impact of increasing fertilizer prices. So the first um, sort of couple of um, columns there is the value of this material based on spring 2020 fertilizer prices. So that's when Ammonium nitrate was 236 pounds a ton. Triple super was 280, and muriate of potash was 269. So at those um, at those costs, your um, your cattle manure was worth six pounds 57 per ton, and your 40 tons per hectare was worth 263 pounds per hectare. Coming to current fertilizer prices, um, these are based on the most recent AHDB figures which is 700 pounds per tonne of AN. I think that might have come down a little bit now. Six, and then about 640 for triple super and muriate of potash. Based on those figures, um, your cattle manure is worth 15 pounds 73 a tonne and over 600 pounds per hectare. That's how much it's worth in terms of if you had to you know, buy those nutrients in. But it's just, it's useful to highlight that um, I think that's quite, well, I think it's quite an effective way of highlighting the value of these, um, of these materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Is there yeah. a difference between cattle and horse manure, sheep manure, chicken manure, and all the rest of the ones you can get? Yeah, that was the perfect intro to the next slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that, um, this this slide here is. Um, I have so for a range of different manure types. So cattle slurry, cattle manure pig slurry, pig manure, poultry manure, digested biosolids, farm source digesting, green compost. For each of those um, manures, I've taken the standard figures from RB209. And I've selected in this column what I'd consider to be a typical application rate. So that's targeted usually on what's a sensible amount to apply that keeps us under the 250 kilograms per hectare total end field limit. Okay, so I think these rates are, are pretty normal for these materials they'll apply this amount of total N, but focus more on these columns. So this is the amount of crop available N you'll get from those. So you can see there is, there is differences between the materials. Um, if you scan down this column here, the high figures you can see, pig slurry and poultry manure, those are um, materials. And then also, I mean, it's cattle slurry a lot, but as well, th these are materials that we class as high readily available nitrogen. So a material is high readily available nitrogen if more than 30% of the um, total nitrogen is in the crop available, is in the readily available form, so in the ammonium N form. Um, so those materials apply more crop available nitrogen and you know, can substitute for more of your bagged fertilizer, fertilizer nitrogen. Something like cattle manure, so solid cattle manure, doesn't apply quite as much, that's 24 kilograms per hectare. And then you can see something like green compost really doesn't have any crop available in. But then also, if you look at the phosphate and the potash columns as well, you can see quite a bit of variability down those columns in terms of the amounts of the nutrients that they'll be applying. So does that mean that poultry manure at eight ton is similar fertilizer value to pig slurry at 50 ton? Um, okay, so let's look. Poultry manure at eight tonnes, so you've got 90, 90 kilograms per crop available and 136 of phosphate and 168 of potash compared to a pig slurry, 99 
7510 yeah a little it's a little bit more isn't it i mean that that yeah. reflects um i mean the that that poultry manure is a 60 percent dry matter material so that's eight tons per hectare of a 60 percent dry matter material whereas the pig slurry is 50 cubes back to a four percent dry matter material so you've got more water going on with that yeah that's, that's great that's so working out with the river why isn't it <laughs> Yeah, all those that, chickens in Hereford. Those chicken uh, farms upstream. Yeah, I yeah, I'm aware of issues there and um the intensity of the livestock um um production in that area being linked to water quality issues. Yeah. Is there any um sort of measure of the amount of um manure you can apply relative to these sort of NVZs and pollution regs and that, or is it just based on that table? You, I mean, from a, from a legislative point of view and also from a good practice point of view, from a legislative point of view, you shouldn't apply more than 250 kilograms per hectare of total nitrogen in organic materials in any one year. So that's why these rates are all targeted to be less than 250. Oh, so mo no more than 250 kilograms per hectare of total N. If you're applying a liquid material, it's good practice not to put on more than 50 cubes in one go so 50 cubes is equivalent to five millimeters and that's just linked to the like the soil's ability to absorb water and you you've got a greater risk of runoff if you're putting high loads of water on which is why we've kept the cattle slurry and the pig slurry at 50 cubes there i wouldn't put more than that on so, so i mean that's one constraining factor but the next constraining factor and the most important thing is actually to look at what that crop needs so if you've got manure you you want to be targeting you you want to be putting it on crops that have a demand for that those nutrients you should not be putting more crop available nitrogen on than your crop needs um, and right. i think that's the sort of thing that could be picked up in an inspection in terms of phosphate and potash they're a little bit different in that they're not as easily lost from the system and generally you know typical applications of these materials quite often apply more than your crop needs but what we say with p and k is then you can apply it rotationally so for example if you put um a 35 ton per hectare application of pig manure that's putting on 210 of phosphate and 280 of potash that will be more I'm, I'm pretty confidently say for most crops that's more than the crop needs but what you've effectively got is you've got extra in the bank that you can take you can you can count towards future crops so it's definitely worth yeah, um, considering the crops that you're growing and the soils that you're applying to when you're looking at the manures. Um, and also, the final thing I'll note on this slide, in terms of phosphate and potash, um, we focus a lot on the nitrogen with, with manures, um, but actually a lot of their nutrient value sits in the phosphate and potash. And you only realise that value if you put it to land that needed that phosphate or potash. So across your, your farm... It's worth bearing in mind how your soils vary in phosphate and potash and targeting those applications to soils that are lower P and K indices. Make sure you make the most of them. And by green waste, do we mean that sort of um, compost and stuff you can get from the council? Yeah. The yeah. PS100. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good source of organic matter contains phosphate or potash. There's, there's no nitrogen in it. Well, there is nitrogen in it, as you know, but, but very little of that is available. That's interesting. Yeah. Can I ask a comment there? Yeah. Um, just I was told that and we went on another course on soil nutrition and we um said that totally said that um the compost that came from the municipal compost wouldn't grow anything and it had no nutrients in it. And so I got came back very depressed, but I'd already planted my plants in it. And they were amazing. They grew beautifully, they were really green, they were really lush compared to the soil I planted directly into my garden, it was fantastic. Okay, that, well, that's great to hear. And I would say green compost, you, you might be seeing a combination of effects there um, because you, it, it's, it's, a, it's an organic material. So you're, you're building your soil organic matter content. Um, you're helping to improve the water holding capacity as well. It does contain phosphate and potash. And whilst I've got zero there for crop available N, there might be some mineralization of that total nitrogen it wouldn't be a huge amount but there might be a little bit so you're probably you're probably seeing a combination of the organic matter effect with with as well um availability of possibly a range of nutrients there 
Yeah, but you'd say, so I've, I've got the quandary at the moment whether to use that compost to plant my seeds into as a seed compost. Would you, you recommend that's not a good idea? Well, that, that depends completely on that material um, and the quality of that. I mean, most of the work we've done with green compost has more been spreading it to land rather than planting seeds in it. I think if you're wanting to plant seeds in it, um, you're, it's the material that you've got. Is it specifically designed um, as a growing media substitute? It is. It is it's, specific, it's, it's municipal compost from the, from the tip. That I yeah. bought it and it's like it's quite reasonably coarse but at the finest they go um very very black and quite a lot of um uh wood bits of wood kind of like fine fine twiggy bits that I've sieved out but I was using it in a regenerative way so I'd put cardboard underneath and planted yeah. directly into it it has very poor moisture holding ability but I was just surprised because everyone says that it won't grow anything. And it was amazing. Okay. <laughs> so something happening there. I don't know. Maybe I should get it analyzed. Should I send it away and get an analysis? Yep. An you could get it, get it analyzed. Yeah. And I would be, um, I mean, and that's fantastic to hear that because that's a, you know, it's a really valuable material that you could then have on your farm. Um, the notes of caution that I would put there is if you're looking to directly grow seeds in it, sometimes compost can have a, um, a higher salt content depending on what's gone into it. And sometimes higher salt or conductivity can, can potentially cause issues with germination. So if you were okay. looking to use it as a, as a compost to grow seeds in, yeah. I might be inclined to kind of do a germination test or test it first. Okay. And the other thing to bear in mind- Ali, is, what, sorry, what you're after, sorry, sorry, Liz, what you're after Ali is, is um, I think we were saying, don't use it in modules and pots and trays, but it is okay to drill into as long as you know the, the layer of it you put in put into isn't too thick. Okay, so use it as a combination. Don't just use it as a growing medium, like yeah, they're doing. I, in I mean, the yeah, re regenerative yeah. model is you get your compost, you put it on cardboard, and you grow everything into it. I was just sort of I'm experimenting, and I I was yeah, you know, it was the compost that I got. So, yeah, well, yeah. if you grow if you grow in sort of module plants, you probably need something better because that that that's too variable to rely on. But um, you can get um, organic, and you can get um, um, peat-free sowing compost, yeah. compost, and you you probably stick to that. But if you're actually drilling something like carrots, I think that's all right to drill into that because they you know they're sort of it's partly mixed with the soil by them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I, thank can you. I, can I help? Because I, I said this in the last time, but when we first started, because we we're doing ours on a no dig basis, which I think is now called regenerative, I don't know, but um, we had municipal compost and we spread it on the soil quite thickly, uh, four inches thick to stop the weeds. And in the first year, I direct sowed some carrots and parsnips, and they all grew perfectly. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, that's what I would expect. I do see green compost used, used as a weed control. I think we mentioned it last week. So, yeah. It, it yeah. Just, you know, those, those crops that's hard to hand weed, like carrots and snips, and that, I think it's quite useful to get it, you know, just it get, you know, it gives the crop a good start. But, but you do. From the source we had, you do have to watch out for a lot of plastic and knives, forks, bottle tops, anything that people forget to and yeah. lose in their compost bin. Yeah, should be all right if it's powers one hundred, but you never, you never really sure. No, it, it depends how how that how far they've sifted it. But yeah, no, that's what we're still ten years on picking out plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's fantastic. I've had no plastic, which is, but I can understand you would. But luckily, so far. Well, I want some of the compost you're getting. The <laughs> I know they've improved in the last 10 years. They most did it, but yeah, there we are. There's not horse manure on this, though, is there? No, there isn't, but there is horse manure in RB209. Um, if you wanted to get some standard figures for that, it's it, it's closest um, to cattle manure in this list. And yeah, if you look at RB29, it's in there. Although that's sort of um, what I would say, which kind of brings me onto this next slide, is it is important. Um, the standard figures that we've got in RB29 and that I base that table off um, are from, um, yeah, so they're from RB29, they're averages, um, that they're, they're averages of analysis of a large number of samples, and they are a good average. 
but they are just that and they do conceal quite a bit of variation in nutrient content so if you do if you are frequently using manures we are really advocating that it's valuable to get a sample analyzed by the lab um, and then you know um, uh, you, you know you have that information on the nutrient content of the material that you've got on your farm so what, yes what well, sorry to interrupt but what sort of uh, percentage organic matter are we we trying to um, get near in terms of soil the, the yeah. higher the better higher the better so we right, look yeah. eight percent eight percent or four um or... i i um that your benchmark really is um is what was the soil in an undisturbed state and we're never going to get back to that are, are we i mean soils naturally across the country um will have would have um would have quite a bit of variation in organic matter content even if we'd never cultivated and we'd never done anything with them and that reflects variation mainly in soil texture and rainfall as well wetter soils tend to have higher organic matter content so um uh, sandy soils we're never going to manage to build the organic matter content to the same extent that you would on a clay clay will hold um, more organic matter if you right. want a sort of a percentage, um, five percent is often batted around as being a sort of a target for organic matter, but it really does depend between um, soil types. And we generally say for cultivated land, the most, the most, the more organic materials that you can get onto it, um, that the better. That there has been some quite nice guidance coming out of AHDB recently from the Soil Biology and Health Project, which. If you are getting your soils analysed from organic matter, what it does is it's got some benchmark figures for organic matter and it's it's divided those down into um, soil texture and rainfall. So if you've got an organic matter for your soil, you can benchmark it, compare it to what sort of average for soils of a similar texture and in rainfall area, which is quite useful. Yeah, brilliant. So yeah, the, just the points. I'm conscious I'm, I've spent quite a long time talking on the first few slides. But, um, so the, the main point on this slide is, you know, this is what we kind of say to farmers in terms of what they should do to make make sure they're making the most of their manure nutrients. So firstly, as I've just said, know what's in it, know the nutrient content. Secondly, um, estimate the crop available nitrogen supply. So how much of that nitrogen that you're putting on is going to be available to the crop? And again, there's guidance in RB29 on how to do that. And there's also a free software tool called MANA that's quite a good way um, that can, you can use to estimate your crop available nitrogen supply. Um, the third point on that list is minimise nitrogen losses. Um, this is most applicable to high readily available end materials, so things like poultry manures and slurries, where, where when you apply those materials to land, they are higher risk of nitrogen losses to the environment. So that's nitrate leaching if you put it on in the autumn winter period, and also ammonia volatilisation losses. So where possible, take steps to reduce those by applying the material when your crop needs the nitrogen. So that would be, that would include sort of um, cover crops over winter, would it? Cover crops will help reduce nitrate leaching. Whether or not, I mean, really, I'm not sure that you should be putting. It's not ideal to be putting um, manure onto a cover crop. Um, my preference would be to put a manure onto a crop. Um, if you're putting manure onto bare soil, you're better to put a cover crop there than not have a crop there. But mm. really, strictly speaking, cover crops don't have a nitrogen requirement. So and I think the EA are a bit twitchy about manures going onto cover crops. But yeah, oh, minimise yeah. nitrate leaching by putting manures on in when the crop's growing and it's not draining. OK. And then the final point is you know, spread it accurately and evenly. Try and say to growers to take as much care over spreading their organic materials as they would their bag fertilizer. And make sure you build it into your farm nutrient management plan. So make sure that you do not back use of your bag fertilizer to account for what you've put on in the manure. A couple of slides on nitrogen and managing nitrogen now. So. Um, uh, the nitrogen recommendations on RB29 I've mentioned already are based on this soil nitrogen supply index um, and soil nitrogen supply that it's it's the nitrogen that's available for the crop to uptake during the growing season and it directly reduces our need to put on fertilized nitrogen. Um, soil nitrogen supply includes um, soil mineral nitrogen, so that's ammonium and nitrate that's in the soil, plus an allowance for any mineralization that happens during the growing um, season. The key and the key factors that, that affect this background of soil nitrogen supply 
our soil type. So it tends to be higher on heavier textured soils that are more retentive of nitrogen. Um, previous cropping, so high residue crops, um, leguminous crops have a higher soil nitrogen supply over winter rainfall. The more, the higher your rainfall, um, the lower your S and S because you've got that over winter rainfall that can leak some of that nitrogen out. Then if you've had regular use of organic manures, that sort of can build your, um, your, your overall soil fertility. And the final point there is just also to take account of previous crop performance. So for example, if, you, if you'd had a crop that failed or yielded really poorly and you'd put nitrogen onto that crop, if that crop hadn't have grown, it wouldn't have taken up that nitrogen. So potentially there might be some circumstances where you could have elevated soil nitrogen because the previous crop maybe didn't, um, didn't utilize at all. So there are two um, there are two main methods that we can, well there are two methods that we can use to assess our soil nitrogen supply. Um, the first and by far the most common method is the what we call the field assessment method, um, and this is where we use information on previous cropping, soil type, and winter rainfall to give ourselves a soil nitrogen supply index. And this is guidance taken directly from RB209. Um, we've got I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. So this is a table here. Um, for, so we've basically got different tables for the different rainfall areas so with three different tables for low, medium and high rainfall. This one here is for high rainfall. So we've got the previous crop type groups down here. We've got the different soil types along here and we've got our soil nitrogen supply um, indices here. So you can see on light land, you tend to be very low SNS across the board. On heavier land, particularly following crops like beans or oilseed rape, then we've got a higher soil nitrogen supply. So that's just that background, um, that background nitrogen in the system. And, and the field assessment method, it, you know, it's a it's a good way. It's it's pretty accurate. Um, it, you know, most growers use it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but the alternative um, method is actually just measuring soil mineral nitrogen. So actually taking a sample and getting it analysed. Um, and that, that can be, benef we tend to say that is of most use where your nitrogen supply is likely to be high or uncertain. So if you've got fields that you're, something a bit different's happened on, or you've, you've had crops of high, um, high residues, that it's those fields where you tend to get the most value from soil nitrogen supply, from soil nitrogen testing. Um, and if that is something that you're looking to do, um, there's some good guidance in RB29 about how to do that. Um, and yeah, the, the timing, ideally, if it's vegetable crops that are planted in the spring, you should take the sample as close to planting as possible. Um, ideally sample down to 90 centimetres or rooting depth and keep the samples cool and get them to the lab as soon as possible. Um, and I do think um, this is, again, because of the price of nitrogen fertiliser, this can and help improve the accuracy of nitrogen use. And it is something worth considering maybe on some, some fields on your farm. The next slide I've got here is, um, it's really, it's a note about matching nutrients to crop demand. Um, you know, logically it makes, this is specifically in terms of nitrogen, um, lo logically it makes sense that we wanna put our nutrients on um, when, when our crop is growing. Um, the first point I've got there, really particularly targeted at veg crops, that sometimes where we put quite a bit of nitrogen on when you plant the crop and when the crop hasn't really grown. Um, I particularly highlighted this recently when I spoke to the leek growers um, because they tend to put quite a bit of nitrogen on the planting um, and the, plant, the crop doesn't take up um, much of that nitrogen in the first couple of months after, after planting. And it's just to bear in mind that there is a risk if you put quite a bit of nitrogen on when you plant the crop and then you have heavy rainfall potentially it could leach and below. So ideally try and split your nitrogen applications to match crop demand. Um, there, are, there are some um, controlled and slow release fertilizer products in the market now that, are, um, that aim to spread that nutrient availability across the season. Um, and logically that, that all sounds good. Um, I would note that we've not got enough evidence of benefit for those products yet. So whilst I think the logic and rationale is there, um, we haven't really seen the evidence of yield benefits from that. And, and the final point in this slide was just to note that, I mean, we have done some work for CF fertilizer. I mean, this is within the context of combinable crops, but we did look at whether there was any benefit of splitting um, nitrogen 
um, applications from the conventional three split down into a six split application, you know, trying to get this better matching nutrients to crop demand. Um, and we didn't actually see a huge benefit. We didn't, th there was very limited evidence of benefit there. Um, moving on to phosphate and potash, I'm just conscious of the time because we're now at five. Um, Rachel, are we all right to go for sort of another 10 minutes? Or, or do you want me to wrap up quite sort of more quickly? No, that's no problem as long Is as everyone's right? happy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so phosphate and potash um, in RB209. Um, the guidance for these is um, we should try and get our soil to P index three for vegetables um, and two for fruit. And the target index of potash is two plus for vegetables and two minus for fruit. Um, where you're below the target index, um, you would expect to see a, you, the, the idea is that you get your soil to the target index. And then once you're at that target index, you maintain it. And if you're at the target index, you're not generally expecting to see a yield response from applied P and K you're applying more P and K when you're at target index just to maintain that target index. But what I would note is if you are below that target index, you are in a circumstance where we would expect you to see a yield response for P and K. So in those circumstances, it's particularly important to look at getting it on in some form or other. Um, we've talked a bit about manures already, just to highlight they are a good source of P and K um, and you're know, just targeting those manure applications to the fields that need it. And a couple of other points there, yeah, just to, to highlight that many of these vegetable crops that you're growing do respond to fresh applications of phosphate and potash. And so when, when I say fresh applications, I mean, in, you know, to that particular crop. So there is guidance in RB209, we've seen in some other crops of, of applying these nutrients rotationally. Um, and I mentioned that in the context of some of the manure applications that, you know, if you apply more than one crop needs, you can take it off the requirement of the following crop. I would be cautious about doing that with vegetable crops, particularly if they are below target, because there is evidence to show that they do respond to these fresh, fresh um, applications of P and K. And then the final point is a, it's a general good practice. Um, make sure that you're taking soil samples for pH, pK and magnesium. So your standard topsoil analysis every three to five years. So you've got a good idea of, of your soil nutrient status. Um, the, the one thing, I mean, as I said earlier, I was sort of having a bit of a focus on nutrient use efficiency um, in, in this presentation. So um, I wanted to highlight for phosphorus, I mean, focus on nitrogen, but to highlight for phosphorus that there are things that you can do to potentially improve the nutrient use efficiency. Um, and one for phosphate is um, potentially placing fertilizer. Um, phosphorus moves very slowly in the soil. And if you've got crops that have a, have a poor root structure, it can take them a little while to reach the phosphorus if you sort of broadcast spread it. And so placing that phosphorus near the seed or near the transplant can increase efficiency and increase yields. Um, and the, the table I've got at the bottom here is just some sort of evidence to show that. We had a project a few years ago, um, we called it the Link Targeted Phosphorus Project. And it, and it showed that placing phosphorus did increase the potato yields compared to broadcast application. So what we've got here is three sites. This is the yield from the broadcast application. This is the yield where we placed it. This is the yield effect. Um, and you can see that for the, the bottom two sites, we had a positive and a statistically significant increase in yields. I know the first site shows a negative effect, but we have to kind of caveat that with that um, unfortunately at that site, we didn't have the equipment to place the phosphorus. So we actually ended up doing by hand. So the researchers that did that one kind of caveat that with that being a bit unusual and that's not really typical. So they would very much, I think the conclusion from this work was, I think it demonstrates the yield benefit of placing phosphorus on crops where, you know, particularly where rooting is limited earlier on. And I think you can draw parallels with potatoes and other vegetable crops there. Mm. And then also I'd like to say, don't forget about sulfur. Um, we've done quite a bit of work on sulfur over, over recent years. Um, for a little while, it was kind of considered a forgotten nutrient. Uh, you know, in the past, we've had you know, a number of decades in the past where um, pollution has been such, pollution from industry has been such that um, we've had sufficient sulfur being deposited on land that we've not needed to fertilize our, our crops of sulfur. That, that has changed now. And um, you can see this graph here shows the reduction in sulfur dioxide emissions um, 
emissions have decreased so substantially that now the amount of sulfur deposition isn't sufficient to um uh, to supply the sulfur needs of our crops i mean obviously from an environmental point of view that's a win and you know, that's a that's a huge positive that we've decreased emissions to that extent but it does mean that um we've had to then over the last particularly the last decade start getting the message out to growers that that they need sulfur they need to put sulfur on their crops now as well um and um, yeah, the, these pictures here are, uh, show deficiency symptoms in combinable crops, which is the typical yellowing of the youngest leaves. And that that deficiency, those deficiency symptoms are, are the same across all crops. It's a common sulfur deficiency is yellowing of the youngest leaves, which is distinct and different to nitrogen deficiency, which is yellowing of the older leaves. And now because of the de decrease in sulfur emissions, in RB209, we now include guidance on sulfur for all crops. Um, the wording that we use is where sulfur deficiency has been recognized or expected. And then these are the rates that we recommend. So 25 to 50 for combinable or for cereal crops, 50 to 80 for all seed rape, 50 to 75 for brassica vegetable crops. They're quite similar to all seed rape and they're quite high in their sulfur demand and then 25 for all other vegetable crops and 15 for all other fruit crops. So we're basically saying that if you're in a high risk situation, and actually this, this risk matrix here is quite useful at highlighting um, which crops we think might be, or which situations may be deficient in sulfur. So sulfur deficiency can be, um, uh, the risk of sulfur deficiency is related to soil type and rainfall. And I think this is the most effective way of, of assessing risk of sulfur deficiency. Don't bother with soil analysis. It doesn't work for sulfur. Basically, if you're on a light textured soil, you're at high risk of sulfur deficiency. And the higher rainfall you are, that increases your risk. So I don't know, I'm making the assumption that in Wales, it rains a lot more than it does over here in Cambridge. If you're in a high rainfall area, you can see that if you're on a light or medium textured soil, you're at high risk. And then if you're on a heavier soil, you're in intermediate risk. So it's worth looking at sulfur. And if you're deficient in sulfur, it, it will reduce your nitrogen use efficiency as well. And then the final one was just sort of a note on um, micronutrients. I mean, I must admit, this is not something that I've, I've, I've done a huge amount of work on myself, but um, it's just worth being aware of this and aware of also where you can go to get, um, to get advice. This table here is copied from um, section five of RB209. And it gives um, it gives the different micronutrients here, and it also then it highlights um, the circumstances under which which these micronutrient deficiencies are going to be most common. And it's usually related to soil type and pH, and it also then tells you um, how what's the best strategy to diagnose that deficiency because we have options, um, we can use soil analysis or leaf, leaf analysis, but um, for some micronutrients, one is less, you know, one might, might not be particularly reliable. So for example, boron, we can um, assess the risk of deficiency from soil analysis, but you can see manganese, the note there is soil analysis is not reliable, but we've got guidance on leaf analysis. And there's also then guidance on how to treat those deficiencies. So I just wanted to highlight, because I think that table is quite a useful one in summarizing our current sort of knowledge and understanding of risk factors, um, diagnosing deficiency and treating deficiency. Um, I think the key thing is to be aware of whether you're, you're at risk of micronutrient deficiency. So I think it was Ali that highlighted, you know, the high pH soils, that could be an issue for you. Um, yeah, so just to sort of highlight that. Chris, I don't know whether you've got you've got anything to say on that, whether you've come across growers that um, that have had issues with micronutrients. I always go back to that um, availability of um, micronutrients at uh, pH levels, and I think I use that as a, as a sort of rough guide, but um, I'm aware of sort of boron deficiency in crops like swedes and um, cauliflower, et cetera. And I yeah. think we, get, we even get molybdenum deficiency in those, but um, generally I think if the pH is all right, then uh, you won't be far off with your, your micronutrients. I don't know if that's yeah. the right generalization. Yeah, um, I think that the the key thing also is once you've seen it, what you know, it's it's knowing your farm and knowing your land. And if you see a micronutrient deficiency once, then you kind of you've seen it and you're on the ball and you know that you're at risk of it. Yeah, I often go on a farm and I see in the the shed they've got a big drum of man manganese feed or 
um, whatever, a mixed feed, and um, it's very rarely opened, and it's been there for years, and I think some enterprising reps sold it to them, but they don't really understand when to use it, so they're not under sure if it's going to go treat the soil or the yeah. foliage yeah. or what, you know, and it's, it's, I think it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a gimmick. Yeah, and I would say that, I mean, they're, they're micro um, because you need them in such small quantities, and for the majority of soils, the crop gets sufficient from the soils. So this is not something that we advocate routinely, but um, it, it's worth being aware of your soil type and the risk factors. And I just think that this is a good, this is a useful yep. table to refer back to. And I think, I think that sort of brings me to the end. Um, yeah, so just to summarise key things, what we've said, we've, yeah, focus on nutrient use efficiency. And I think now more, you know, um, now in particular, um, with the price of nutrients, it, it's about taking steps to try and be as accurate as possible. You know, get the basics right first. We've gone through all those. And then we've also highlighted sort of some other strategies that you can potentially think about for the future. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I think Sorry, a few yeah, minutes later than planned. Um, yeah, was... having that on the knowledge of, I think, could be a useful resource now because it's covered a lot of um, quite tricky issues that aren't explained well elsewhere. Yeah, Definitely. and sometimes with a lot of things, it's worth just being aware to get where, where these tables and bits of advice are. Yes, um, actually going to that, could you tell us exactly how to access that? Um, that document, if you, um, if you Google RB209 section six, you will get um, a link to it. All right, okay. Um, I might just put, put it up, see whether I can find it quickly. Fine. I have frequently been asked, why did we call it RB209? And I'd say it was just 209 in the series because the RB208 is actually pairs and there's even an RB something on rhubarb. So they all had their own, their own RB number and 209 just happened to be the fertilizer one. Yeah, I'm going to put the link this. in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was reference book 209, wasn't it, Chris? Right. And it was at the first copy was what, something 19. We're on the ninth edition now. I think the first or the earliest copies were sort of the 1970s. I think we've got a complete set of them here. Yeah, and it was at that part. point, yeah, oh. reference book to a RB209. And that's kind of stuck. And I know when AHDB took it over, they tried to check, they tried to drop it and just call it the nutrient management guide. And everybody just said it, but it's just RB209. So they relented and put RB209 in brackets at the end of it. It's good. Yeah, I like that. I think RB208 pairs is, is way out of date, but I mean, there's only one edition of that. Yeah, so I hope, I hope that was, there were some yeah. bits there that were of use. Um, if anyone's got any questions, happy to take them. Or equally, if there's something that you think about afterwards, I'm more than happy for you um, to drop me a line. Um, Rachel, you've got our contact details and ha I'm happy for you to pass those on. Lovely, great. Yeah, fantastic. That Lizzie, it was brilliant. Good stuff. Lovely. There you go. I'm just going to pop the link to the next webinar. We've got another one now on the 23rd next Thursday. That is disease in salad crops and how to save losses. So I'll just pop that in the chat if anyone wants to attend. Um, thank you very much. And uh, let us know if you have any questions. Yes. Uh, thanks thank very you. much, Lizzie. Very interesting. Thank you. Good stuff. Thank you for joining. I'm going to leave.